Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Praise God. I want to greet everybody tonight in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. Amen. The Bible says there is none like him and there is none to be compared to him. Scriptures declare that from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the very same, the name of our God is to be praised. And how good it is for us to be in Bible study tonight, amen, to be speaking another word from the throne of God. And I pray, God, that, that God will bless somebody. I believe that this word tonight is for somebody, that somebody may understand our Christian heritage, understand where we come from, understand who we belong to. Amen. So it's my desire tonight under God that we might give a word that comes directly from his throne, that somebody will be left blessed, somebody will be left understanding who they are in God. Amen. Now, tonight I'll be trying to examine three main things. Firstly, I want to look at my apostolic roots. Amen. My Christian roots. I want to look at who I am really as a Christian. Amen. Secondly, I want to look at the Pentecostal experience and the early church. Because if we're going to talk about our heritage or talk about our identity, amen, we want to look back at where it all began. Amen. And how does it apply to me today? I want to look at the expectation. What is God's expectation of the church today? What does God expect of you? What does God expect of me as Christians today? Amen. We are living in a time where, amen, uh, I think the devil is trying to rob us of who we are supposed to be in God. But I'm glad that God finds it fit tonight to speak a word to somebody's heart. I pray, God, in this Bible study that will be enlightened, and at the end of the day, we will move as thus say the Lord. Praise God. Now, it has always been God's plan for his ways to be passed down from godly parents to children. Amen. As we look through the scriptures, we realize that God always intended, amen, for his word, for his knowledge, amen, for the things of God to be passed on from one generation to another generation. Uh, his intention was always seen throughout scriptures and if you look at example in Genesis chapter 18 and from verse 18 to 19 the scriptures actually tell us that seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nation of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. So here it is that the scripture is telling us, even through Abraham's life, amen, that it is God, God was saying that he was a godly man and he was going to be blessed. And not only that, but Abraham, because of his, the fact that he's a man of God, he's going to ensure that he's going to command his children and his household after him. In other words, whatever he has learned from God, and you can remember the life of Abraham, God called him, out of the land of the Chaldeans. God called him from a, from a people, amen, that he was acquainted with to a place that he didn't know where he was going. And God gave him something. God placed something in his heart. But not only that, God said, look here, man, you're not going to keep it for yourself. But those persons that are going to come after you, your household, your children, amen, is going to command these same things that you have learned of me to them. Amen. So we see that this is always God's intention to pass down his ways, as I said earlier, from godly parents to children. We also see it in Psalms chapter 78 and verse 1 to 8. And there was a guy by the name of Asap. And when you read those eight verses, praise God, he was contemplating on two things in these verses. If we read from verse 1 to verse 4, we realize that he was talking about passing on the lessons, amen, from the past, amen, and he was saying that when you have these lessons, it will give you wisdom for the future. So verse 1 to 4, he was telling the children of Israel, as he wrote in this song, that look here, you need to pass a lesson that you have learned on from the past. That it might give you wisdom for the future. And there are a few verses I want to pick out from Psalm chapter 78, from verse 1 to 8. For example, verse 3, which we have heard and known, and of our fathers have told us. So here Asaph is saying, all these things, he didn't just get it by himself. 
but he learned it from his fathers. He learned it from persons that were ahead of him. We will not hide them from our children. So he went on to say, look, here, all the things that we have learned, we will not hide it, but we'll pass it to our children. Amen. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. So here it is that Asap is saying that, look here, all the things that he has learned in the past, he's not going to keep it to himself, but he's going to pass it on to the generation to come. And he spoke about everything. Talk about giving praises to the Lord. The fact that God is a wonderful God. The fact that God gives us strength. He didn't want to keep it to himself, but he was passing it on from one generation to the other. From verse 5 to 8, Asap go on to present the generation must avoid the errors of the previous one. So not only that must we pass on what we have learned, but we must also show them the error that the, the, the previous generation has, had made. Amen. It is said that a wise man will learn from his mistake, but a wiser man will learn from another person's mistake. So what we find is that Asap was saying in from verse 5 to 8, that look here, there are some mistakes that people in the past have made. And he's telling the children in his song, in his writing, that look here, these are the mistakes that they have made and you should avoid them at all costs. So here we see that it was a custom in the Old Testament for them to pass on what they have learned from one generation to the other. Another famous one is the Shema, and that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 4 to 7. And, you know, I like this verse because um, I, 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 one of my siblings, what she does is that she ensures that her children actually say this particular verse every morning. And I love the fact that it is done that way. And I've taken on the practice that every time we have Kristen and Kylie, I actually pass on, amen, these particular verses to them. So it's the Shema, which means to hear. And what is happening is that they are passing on something, amen, from one generation to the other. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, from verse 4 to 7 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Here is part now. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. In other words, we're not going to keep it to ourselves that the fact that we know that there is one God and the fact that we know that we must love the Lord with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. We must teach these things diligently unto our children. How we do it? We must talk of it when we sit in our house and when we walk by the way and when we lie down and when we rise up. In other words, at every point in our lives where we get the opportunity, amen, to pass on this information, we should. And I believe that this is what God intended for us. And we see it even from the Old Testament where God's intention was to pass on his knowledge from God's parents to his children, from one generation to the other. This is a principle that we're going to be talking about tonight. Praise God. Now, I want us to understand something. You see, it is important that we do this because, you see, if our godly heritage is not passed down from generation, then the Bible says there's going to arise a generation that, two things, they do not know God, they do not know his work. And guess what? Eventually, what will happen to a generation that do not know God and a generation that do not know the works of God, they will eventually sin against God. Amen. So God saw it very important, amen, that we pass our Christian heritage. We hold fast our Christian heritage at all times. And I believe in a time like this, amen, it's very important that we must be reminded, amen, of what was taught by the apostles. We must be reminded of what was taught by the first century church and never lose sight of that. Because if we lose sight of this, just like God said, if we lose sight of our godly heritage, we're going to arise a generation that do not know God and a generation that do not know the works of God and they will eventually sin against him. Now there's a popular verse I want us to look at in Judges chapter 2 from verse 7 to 10. Now in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7 to 10, and I'll take snippets from it, 
It says, and the people served the Lord. Now, I want you to understand something. The children of Israel left Egypt. They were about, uh, according to history, there were approximately about 2 million people uh, that left Egypt. And they left Egypt as slaves. And I want you to understand that when they left Egypt, God took them the long way. The long way. And it so happened that here it is that they went the region, the Sinai region. And they came and, and we know what happened. They wandered 40, 40 years in the wilderness because they doubted God at Kadesh Barnea. We know the story well. But guess what happened? Eventually, the generation after them rose up and these people became a mighty people. Amen. To the point is, to the point that when they went into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, amen, the people were a mighty people. Every person who heard of Israel, every people or every nation that heard that Israel was coming, they were trembling. They were shaking because mighty Israel, imagine that they left Egypt as slaves, but now they're a mighty army. Can I tell you something? Every process that you go through is in preparation to make you into a mighty person. Amen. So we realize that what God did for them seemed hard. But at the end of the day, it was to make them into the people that they ought to be. So they went over into the promised land. And we know the story well. Everywhere they went, they were conquering. The book of uh, Joshua is a book of conquest. Amen. We see where they are conquering um, all the lands. Where they were inhabiting all the places that God had promised them. Amen. And they got all that they needed. But guess what? By the time we left the book of Joshua and we jump into the book of Judges, we had a frightening experience in Judges chapter 2. It says in verse 7, And all the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. So as long as Joshua was around, the people were serving God. And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. So there were a set of people that Joshua passed the heritage to. And the people served God as long as these people were alive. Who had seen all the great works of God. And he did, that he did for Israel. So here it is that the nation now settling in their land. Was serving God. All the days of Joshua. All the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. Who had seen the great works of the Lord. That he did for Israel. But verse 10 gave us a shock. It says... And there arose another generation after them. In other words, after the generation died out in Joshua's generation, and the elders that outlived Joshua, the Bible said there arose another generation after them. Guess what? Look what happened. Which knew not the Lord. This is Israel, you know. They knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So guess what starts happening now? Because... There arose a generation who didn't know about the Lord, which is striking and frightening for me. It means that there came a time where Israel was in a cycle, amen, of up and down. Actually, when you study the book of Judges, you realize that it's a book of cycle. Theologians call it cycle of the book of Judges, amen. Because here it is that they are living in a time, amen, where they were up and down. So guess what happened? The people have a way of, they would uh, rebel against God. They would turn from God. And that was a cycle. If you look in Judges chapter 3, for example, it says the people turned from God. They, they, they turned from God. And guess what God did? God rose up a, gen, a, a nation, amen, uh, and, and this nation would actually put the people under bondage. They were placed under bondage. Can you imagine mighty Israel, that when they came and they conquered the promised land, everybody was afraid of them. But there came a generation that didn't know God. Amen. And because they did not know God, there came a cycle in their lives. Amen. They, did, they served all the false gods. And God had to do something to, to get their attention. So there came nations that came up against them and have them under bondage. And guess what they do? They would pray and they would ask God. Because this is the point. They, they knew some things of their forefathers. But they really didn't know the God of their forefathers. So they prayed and they said, God, deliver us from this particular thing that we are under. And then God would have done. God would have risen up a judge. And this judge would have come and would have delivered them 
and then there would be a time of peace. And guess what happened? Because the people did not know God, the cycle started again. They went back into apostasy, and then there came a time when God had to raise up another nation, and another nation, to keep them under bondage. They seek God, God raised up a judge, and the cycle continued. Can I tell you something, brethren? We have to be careful that we don't fall in the same trap like Joshua and the elders that outlived Joshua did. We have to be careful that and be very careful that we pass on our Christian heritage to the young people today. Amen. And, and trust me, we are living in a time where it's very important that they know who they are. It's our key responsibility as children of God. Amen. Especially those who have been in Zion for a while. It's our key responsibility. It's a vital obligation of each generation to ensure that our godly heritage is preserved. There are some things that we cannot put aside. There are some things that we cannot say it's too old-fashioned. Mm -mm. Brethren, there are some things that we cannot lay down aside and say it's no longer working. Amen. If it worked in that time, we serve a God who we know it will work again. But when we discard our Christian heritage, then we will realize that it comes with problems. Now, to preserve is to keep something in its original state. Our aim is to keep this apostolic message in its original state. Our aim is to keep this apostolic power and movement in its original state. Our aim is to ensure that when we preach the gospel message, it's not a message that tickles the fancy but does not move the heart. Our aim is to ensure, like the Peter on the day of Pentecost, that when we preach this gospel message, that people are going to come and say, what must I do to be saved? In other words, so to preserve is to keep something in its original state, ensuring that it is not lost or decayed. We don't want to be following every and anybody. We want to ensure that what was done in the first century is done today. Let me quickly define what heritage means. When we say heritage, a heritage speaks of the traditions. It speaks of the achievements. It speaks of the beliefs, etc., which are a part of a history or a group. Can I tell somebody this tonight? that there are some traditions, there are some achievements, there are some beliefs that we have, even from the church inception, that still holds true and will still hold true until Christ comes back. No matter what the devil tries to put in, holiness is still in style. No matter what the devil tries, Christian living is still important. No matter what the devil tries, the name of Jesus is still the most powerful name. And there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No matter what doctrine or new age thing that we come in with, it doesn't matter. If you have not repented of your sins, if you're not baptized in Jesus' name, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you are not saved. And I want somebody to understand the same way they preached it in the first century is the same way we're going to preach it today. Because we are preserving our Christian heritage. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 10 that we must ensure that we do not remove the old landmark. So as it was with the children of Israel, so it is with the church. We are to ensure that the old landmark is not removed. Can I tell you something? If you look at it from a, uh, from a historical perspective, you'll realize why it was important to maintain landmarks. If you try to remove your landmark, what you're trying to do is steal. It's, it's a form of stealing. Amen. Every person was given a boundary. Amen. And you had to reside within a particular boundary. So when the writer of Proverbs was writing, he was writing based on the concept of what they knew a landmark was. So in other words, you had to ensure that you are in a boundary. If you try to take over somebody else's boundary, then you have, you're in a state of stealing. Or if you remove most of your boundary, you're putting yourself at, uh, at a loss. But maintain what God has given to us. So we must ensure preservation 
of the sacred tradition inherited from our early apostolic fathers. We have to preserve all the sacred things that Paul spoke about. All the sacred things that Peter preached on. All the sacred things that the apostles gave their lives for. Because that's our key responsibility to preserve our Christian heritage. Now, in order for us to preserve our heritage, we have to go back to our Christian roots. We need to look back at what the scriptures is actually saying as it relates to our roots. What is our root? What exactly is the foundation upon which this church was built? Let us try to go there. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, amen, that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and of the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we see our foundation. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being our chief cornerstone. So our heritage, if you think about it, is based on biblical teachings and traditions of the apostles of the first century. So if the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, it means that what the apostles and the prophets taught when the church started is what we should build our foundation upon. In other words, we can't lay no other foundation than that which is laid. We have to ensure that whatever we teach, whatever we preach, is based on what the Bible says. It's based on what the apostles have already laid down for us. So in imparting the heritage, the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he instructed the saints in two things, in their manner of lifestyle. But, well, we come more than two things, really. He spoke about our manner of lifestyle. He spoke about sound doctrine. He spoke about holiness. He spoke about leadership. And you can find that all the way through the New Testament. What was he doing? He was ensuring that whatever it is that was stated from the church started was passed on. I don't... I strongly believe that God loved us enough to ensure that the scriptures were written. Amen. And even though men, amen, over the years have declared that the word of God would have passed away for many decades and, and there were going to come a point in time where there would be no more scriptures, I am glad to say that I still have the word. And therefore, because I have the word, the Apostle Paul and the apostles from the first century, amen, they instructed us on an inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That how we should live as saints, our manner of lifestyle, the type of doctrine that we should come with, our holiness and leadership. So we are commanded, based on scripture, to bring these things into remembrance of the church. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. So we must bring these things into remembrance of the church. And we are commanded not only to bring them into remembrance of the church, but we are commanded to put them into practice, to command them, and to teach them in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, he said, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, or Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, he said, these things, the end part says, these things command and teach. So in other words, Paul is saying, look here, there are some things that I have instructed you, Timothy, to, to tell the, 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 the church. And you must always bring these things into remembrance. Bring it to remembrance of my ways, what I taught you, what I show you. Amen. And command them and teach them. So our root is that we are commanded to teach the word. And we are commanded to do the word. And we are commanded to tell people how to live. Our instruction from the first century is based on, is to be passed down to two things. Two main ways that the, the heritage must be passed down. One, 
our teaching, and that's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And secondly, our lifestyle, which is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. We don't need to look at those scriptures, but I'll just mention them. So our instructions from the first century church is to be passed down through one, our teaching. I want to make mention of that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And secondly, our lifestyle, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10. Now, understanding where we are coming from help us to answer a particular question. It helps us to realize who am I. And let me just slow down a bit here. One of the reasons why we operate sometimes the way we do is because we don't know who exactly we are. We don't know exactly our heritage and the power and what God has instilled in us. I remember years ago at a convention, praise God, there was a preacher who preached a particular message that has never left me. I think it was the year 2000 or year 1999, one of them. He went on to say, you are an eagle, you are not a chicken. Never forget that message because he brought out the example of how an eagle, the power of the eagle, the eagle is able to see for miles. Praise God. The eagle is able to fly above storm. The eagle builds its nest way up in the mountain top. The eagle is like the king of birds. The power that it has, it can fly through storms. Powerful bird. But he told the story of a particular eagle who grew up among chickens. And he said because the eagle grew up among chickens, it thought of itself as being a chicken. So even though it had all the power to fly above storms, even though it had the power to soar uh, even true storms themselves and, 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 and it was the king of birds and other birds fear it because of its company because of who it associated itself with it forgot who it was and that eagle who was supposed to be soaring the air was on the earth searching for worms that is why I believe in this time and in this season, it's important for us to realize and understand our Christian heritage. Because our Christian heritage will affect our identity. It will tell you that, look here, you are not who you say you are. A lot of us live way beneath what God has called us to be. Because we... Don't realize who we are. Can I say to somebody, like the preacher said, you are not a chicken. You are an eagle. And therefore, don't let the devil, amen, try to tell you, based on your past or your situation or what you have gone through, that look here, you are a chicken. No, you are not a chicken. It is the plan of God that we never forget who we are. It's the plan of God for us to realize who we are. You see, your identity, brothers and sisters, is not defined by your job. You are not a scientist who is a Christian. You are not a chemist who is a Christian. You are not a computer programmer who is a Christian. No. Your job does not identify who you are. You are a Christian who happens to do programming. You are a Christian who happens to be a scientist. And if, if you're not a scientist and you're, 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 you're the, the floor, you are Christian first. Our identity is not defined by our financial status. Actually, some of us will never be rich in this life. And we always, always remember that as Christians, we are called to be 
a pilgrims, which means that we are just passing through. So our true riches is not in this life. Our true riches is not on this earth. But our true riches is stored up in heaven. And where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. So our identity is not defined by our jobs or our financial status or our successes. Some of us, because we don't have a PhD or because we have a PhD, we think that we are something or we are not something. No, no, no. Amen. It's not defined by your grades. It's not even defined by your appearance or what other people say about us. And you have to be careful because a lot of times we forget that irrespective of where we are, amen, we are where we are because God put us there. So it's not defined by what other people say about us or what we have done. Our identity, child of God, is who God said you are. And that's why we say God's plan is for us to understand our heritage because he wants us to understand who we are. And it's very important because I want to know what God has to say about me. Amen. Can I tell you something? First of all, the devil's aim, as I said earlier, is to rob us of our identity. But when you became a child of God, amen, you have to shift your mind to the point where we align our identity with what God says about us. Amen. Our alignment has nothing to do with how we presently think. Our alignment has nothing to do with how we think or feel or act. Amen. We must align ourselves with what God has to say about me. Who does God say I am? That's very important. We can only get all that God has to say of us when we align ourselves with what he says. And guess what? The first thing that we find in Genesis is that God says we were created in the image and the likeness of God. Amen. We were not created in the image and the likeness of nobody else, not the angels. Amen. No matter how splendid for us they are, how magnificent they are. Amen. We were not created in their image. But you were created in the image of God. Amen. God was the one who came down and he formed you from the dust of the earth. Hallelujah. God was the one who he never said, let there be Andrew. Or let there be this person. No. He formed Adam from the dust of the earth. Amen. He came down and he did a work. And guess what he did? He blew his breath into man. And he said, this, my God. And because he blew his breath into man, you are created in the image and the likeness of this God. What a magnificent God. So it means then, it's just like, my name is Andrew. Because my parents named me Andrew. In other words, my identity I can't go around and tell people I am Mark John or I am Peter. But on my birth certificate, my name is Andrew because my parents decided that my name would have been Andrew. Can I tell you something? When God formed you, no matter what the devil say you are, he can't decide who you are. Because guess what? God already decided that, look here, you are formed in my image and my likeness. The only reason why some of us operate the way we do it's because we do not realize, brethren, that we are really created. We have not aligned our minds to the fact that we were created in the image of God. Now, let me tell you something about God. What I like about God. God saw it fit to ensure that he gave you tonight this personal message. And let me tell you how it works. There's a scripture in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 11 to 12. And as I said earlier, because the children of Israel did not know who they are, they were constantly in a cycle of up and down. They were constantly running from different, different nations. At one time, Crucian, king of Mesopotamia, he was hiding from him. They were hiding from the Midianites. They were hiding from the Canaanites. They were hiding from all kind of people. Amen. 
So by the time we reach Joshua chapter, or Judges chapter 6, here we find there was a gentleman who practically was hiding. He was threshing wheat and he was hiding from a nation. I strongly believe that when the children of Israel came into the promised land, probably this nation too feared them. But because they lost their identity, amen, they didn't realize who they are then the nation could have easily had them under bondage. So here it is that the Midianites had uh, the children of Israel under bondage. And here it was a man that was threshing uh, wheat and hiding from the Midianites. By the one person, he was hiding from the Midianites. And we see it in, Josh, in Judges chapter 6. It says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Orpah, that pertain unto Josh the Amorite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So this could tell you what he was doing. He was hiding. He never realized who he was. But guess what? The Bible said the angel of the Lord. Now, many theologians would tell you that the term there for the age of the Lord, actually, when you look at it in the Hebrew setting, it really speaks to God himself. This was a theophany of God that appeared to Gideon. Now, can you imagine? Gideon see himself as somebody who was afraid. Somebody hiding from the Midianites. God didn't send the message of who he was by Gabriel or by Michael. But the God who framed the universe. The God who said, let there be and there was. The God who spoke everything into being, the God who holds, I mean, this earth in its place, ensure that the sun don't move out of its place and the earth rotates around its, its axis. The God who ensured that everything is in its place, that God came down. And the Bible said that God appeared unto Gideon. And he looked at him and he said, Mighty man of valor. I'm here to tell somebody tonight that, as I said earlier, you are not defined by what you have gone through. You are not defined by what the devil say you are or who the devil say you are. You are defined by who God say you are. And God is telling somebody tonight that you need to get back to a place where you realize that you are a mighty man of valor. Realize that you are a person of God. I said before, you are defined by, how, by who God say you are. And God will make it his personal business to ensure that he comes down to tell you that. Amen. I, I strongly believe that when men lost their identity in the Garden of Eden, when, when, when man lost who they are in the Garden of Eden, amen, they realized that they, they lost out. The devil was now seemingly rejoicing. And God could have sent anybody. God could have sent anyone. But God, because he wanted you to get the message, he came himself to ensure that he could tell you that look here, you can be more than what you are. You don't have to be wallowing in sin. You don't have to be eating from the pigsty. Amen. You don't have to be living a life that's beneath you. You are a prince. You are a king with God. You're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are more than who you think you are. Amen. God will come out of his way to ensure that he sits on amen, a well. Even at the middle of the day. When people think that you are a prostitute. When everybody has sold out on you, when everybody gave up on you, Jesus will go in a town, in a place, amen, in Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria because there is somebody that he must meet with that must know who you are. God wants you to know who you are, amen. And he will sit there on the well, even at the middle of the day, just to meet you, to let you know that you are not a chicken you're an eagle you are not what society defines you as when you become a child of God and I and, and, and this is what I want us to get in our minds because many people are beginning to walk beneath what God has called them we are allowing the world to dictate to us while it should be the other way around where we should be the light in this world we are allowing the customs of the world to come into the house of God. When we are the one that should be the salt of the earth. 
We are allowing the things that the world is saying is the ups and the downs. Amen. For us to dictate what is up and down. Can I tell you something? If the Bible says it is wrong, it does not matter what the world says. If the Bible says it is right, it does not matter what the world says. Follow the book. Because guess what? You are a child of the king. So let us look at what God says about you. What does God say about you? The Bible first of all says that you are a child of God. I wonder if somebody could just look at themselves and say, I am a child of God. The Bible says in St. John chapter 1 verse 12, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You have power with God. Amen. God, 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 look here. It does not matter what happened last week. If you are willing to, to come into alignment with what God is saying about you, trust me, it works wonders in your life. What is God saying about you? God is saying that you are a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things, not some things, everything has become new. It doesn't matter that you are in the world and you are a thief. Amen. It doesn't matter that you are in the world and you are a prostitute. Amen. It doesn't matter that you are in the world and you are a gunman. Ah, when you come to Christ, all things have become new. What does God say about you? God said you are called to be a saint. As I said earlier, you are, you are not, a, you're not a programmer who is a saint. You're a saint who is a programmer. Because God has called you to be a saint. Galatians chapter 4 verse 17 says you're not a slave. You're not a slave to your past. You're not a slave to the fact that uh, you, you did something back in the day. And everybody knew about it. Guess what? In the eyes of God, in the eyes of who matters the most, if you find back that place in God, trust me, you're not a slave, but you're a child of God. And most of all, you are a citizen of heaven. Can I tell you something? One of the reasons why royalty behave the way they do, because they understand who they are. So the royal family in the different countries behave like royalty. They don't dress in every and everything. They don't put on any and anything. They don't carry themselves any and any way because they understand who they are. When we begin to understand who we are as Christians, we will not allow the world to pollute us. In other words, our influence should be so strong that somebody is going to say, there is a difference about this particular person. Amen. What does God say about you? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 to 10. And I like this verse. It says, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people. You know, it, it, nowadays people don't want to be peculiar anymore. But trust me, as a child of God, you are different. And trust me, you will note the difference. Because, guess what, you are a peculiar people. That is why, when you're in certain functions, you don't feel like you're setting or you don't feel fitting. Because when you have the Holy Ghost inside of you, you're a peculiar, you are a peculiar person. That you should show forth the praises of him, what call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in the time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. In other words, you are now a person of God. You're not a child of God. Now, let me explain something to you. A few years ago, a preacher preached a particular message. And I tend to hold on to certain things uh, from, from those times. Because they, they really mean a lot to me uh, as a child of God. A preacher preached a message one time. He said, look here. A limp walk with God is not a lame walk with God. Never forget that. He said, limping, but you're not lame. In other words, sometimes you might have to go through some things based on what you have done. Sometimes there might be a case where God will have to touch in a thigh because of what you... But it's better to have an encounter with God. Because it's always better to be on the Lord's side than to be anywhere else. When you are in tune with God... You might be walking with a limp, but you're not lame. 
and everybody's going to know that here goes Jacob, who is no longer Jacob, but no, he's now Israel. You are not who world decide who you are. You are who God says you are. And I want you to hold that to your heart. Now, there is a great danger when we do not know the real thing. And that is why I said, child of God, it's very important as children of God that we understand our heritage. We understand where we are coming from. We understand who we are in Christ. Because when we do not uh, know what the real thing looks like or feels like, amen, we do not get the full benefits and we do not operate as God would have us to operate. Now, there's a particular verse that, that, that every time I read it, I always quake and I always say, God, I hope I am not in this particular uh, category. And that is in the book of Ezra, chapter 3 and verse 12 to 13. It says, But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men, now, let me tell you, let me give the background behind this first. Here it is that the children of Israel came out, it's Ezra chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. Here it is that the children of Israel, after spending 70 years in what we call Babylonian captivity, now this is called the post exilic period, the period after the captivity. And we can remember, you have people like Nehemiah, who that came and he rebuilt the wall. You have people like Ezra. And Zerubbabel and these people that rebuild the temple. And here it is that they built a temple. And they were dedicating the temple. So this is the context behind what this verse is talking about. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, in other words, the first temple, when the foundation of this house was laid, before their eyes wept with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy. So here it is that we are seeing two different reactions. We are seeing a set of people who are crying. And we are seeing a set of people who are rejoicing. In verse 13 it says, So the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Now let me tell you what. Strike me about this particular verse. You see, the older people knew the temple, or knew of the temple of Solomon. They understood, amen, the glory that came with the dedication of the temple. If you can remember when Solomon uh, dedicated the temple, the presence of the Lord came down so rich that it said that the minister could not minister. Everybody were on their faces before God. It was a powerful experience. It was a mighty experience. But guess what happened? Years after, they were dedicating a new temple. Remember? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and he destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple. All of these type of things. And they were dedicating a new temple. Brethren. And here it is that in the midst of the crowd stood two set of people. One, you had the older set of people who knew about the Solomon Temple, who knew about the glory of God, hallelujah, who knew about the presence of Almighty God, who knew what took place when the temple was dedicated. And when they saw what was happening, and that they, it was not as glorious, it was not as magnificent, amen, they wept, they cried, but yet still, there was another set of people in the same crowd who never really knew of Solomon's temple. They were happy for what they saw. They were glad because they were, the temple was being dedicated. I don't want to be in a time where I rejoice in a church that have missed the glory of the first century church. Can I tell you something? Something magnificent happened on the day of Pentecost. Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one accord and in one place. That's the first thing. One of the things that made the first century church magnificent and glorious and the presence of God came down because they were all in one accord and in one place. 
Amen. In other words, what made it important is the unity that existed. And the Bible said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And filled all the house. In other words, it was not just a pathway. It wasn't just a smoke. It filled the house where they were sitting. And the Bible said, there appeared unto them cloven tongues light as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. So magnificent was the, the moment that people that were afar off were wondering what was taking place in the upper room. I mean, people were wondering, what is this? Some people couldn't fathom it. So they start to mock and say, these men are full of new wine. And I remember Peter getting up and preaching the message. And when he finished, the Bible said they were pricked in their hearts. I mean, I, 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 I would I read the book of Acts and I look at the fact that Peter was walking through the crowd and there were people who he couldn't touch and the shadow of Peter went over them and people were healed. When I look in the first century church and I look at the fact that as, as, as Peter and John went to the gate temple and they, they sat a man there and he wanted arms and Peter said, we don't have it. But what we have, that's what I want. What Peter have is what I want. But guess what? What Peter had is what we have today. But guess what? We are living in the glory of the second temple and not the first. Holy Ghost. I want us to understand that we need to understand who we are. We are not just any and anybody. We are not a nominal set of people. We are the church triumphant. We are the ecclesia, the called out ones. And therefore we have to operate as such. But guess what? It's going to take some work. It's going to take us understand and align our minds with who God say we are. So there was a mixed sound. The older people knew that this temple did not match up to the glory of the first. Can I tell you, I often wonder, I often wonder, brethren, if the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter or the Apostle John, should God should rise them up and bring them back to church today? Would they identify us? Would they come to church and say, this is the church? Amen. When they look at how we treat each other, when they look at how we think of each other, when they look at the, the things that we do to each other, would they say that this is the church? Amen. When they look at how the power of God operates, and, and can I tell you something? God has not diminished. God is the only constant in our lives. God can not change. God can become more powerful than he is. He is all powerful. He can become more magnificent. He's all magnificent. He has not changed and he will not change. So if we are not seeing the power that the first century church had, if we are not seeing the power that we read about in the book of Acts, it means that something else in the equation has changed. And this is not God. It is me and you. Help me, Holy Ghost. So the Pentecostal church, we need to understand some things. I don't want to miss out on who I am. I want to be called who God calls me to be. So before you are a child of God. You are a saint of the most high God. You are not a slave. You are a citizen of heaven. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar person. Amen. You are not. You, you, you need to walk as God has called you to walk. You need to talk as God has called you to talk. You need to live like as God. Can I tell you something? We have to be careful that we are not sending out a message to people that the church seemingly has lost its power. We need to ensure that people understand that we are still the light of the world. We are still the salt of the earth. Amen. And therefore, we have to operate as such. Now, let us look at the Pentecostal experience in the early church. Now, as we get into the point of knowing who we are, we need to look at some things that would make us first realize what we uh, need to do to get back to what God wants us to be. So before the church was physically manifested, its foundation was already laid. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 to 19. And you know the funny thing about it, let's just look at verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, his disciples saying, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? In other words, he was asking them because 
he, by this time, he knew that people were talking. He was a man that, that, that did miracles that, were, that, that, that blew the minds of people. He walked on water. He turned water into wine. He did magnificent things. And he brought his disciples into Caesarea Philippi. And he said, look here, who do men say that I am? And they gave him an answer. He said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say that thou art Elias or Elijah. Some say that thou art Jeremiah or Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. You see, one of the things I realize about God. Sometimes he will ask us questions. But the truth is, at the end of the day, it really comes right back to you. Because he really, I think the interest was not so much on what people say. Even though we have to be careful that we are not influenced by what people say. So he knew what the people were saying. He knew what society has to say in relation to what the word of God says. Nowadays we live our lives like we are in Hollywood. We live our lives that we are watching TV. But God is saying like he said to his disciples. But whom say ye that I am? In other words. There's going to come a point in time. Where what is important is not what the crowd says. What is important is not what your neighbor says. As a matter of fact. Each and every one of us. When we stand before Christ. Amen. Amen. And we stand before him. What is important is not what people or your crowd that you followed or people that influence you. God is going to ask you, so what did you do? In a similar way, he asks his disciples, whom say ye that I am? Who am I? This was very important. And the Bible says in, uh, I think verse 18 or 19, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ. The son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him. Blessed art thou Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. But my father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So from the, the inception. From, from the very beginning from the early days we can deduce from Matthew chapter 16 two important things one the church is built upon an understanding of who Jesus is in other words you knowing who you are is is is, is directly related to you knowing who Jesus is because when you understand who Jesus is then you can begin to operate in how he wants you to operate. So the church in Matthew chapter 16, or the early church, or from the early days, we can do two things from Matthew chapter 16. The church is built upon an understanding of, one, who Jesus is, and secondly, the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, or the, the, the highest point of hell, or the hardest part of hell, or the most significant, or the most magnificent, or whatever, Depending on how you look at it. The most powerful part of hell cannot prevail against the church. Child of God, if you don't know who you are and you don't know who Jesus is, you're on the losing side. If you're on the side of the gates of hell, it will not prevail against the church. And no matter how it looks like things are going a particular way, amen, at the end of the day, we are part of the church triumphant. So we must begin to understand who we are and who Jesus is. And what we we'll realize, brethren, is this. You see, the devil, the devil wants to attack and change everything that the word of God actually puts out there. The devil wants to shift the identity and everything that the Bible has instituted the devil wants to shift it all together you know recently I saw uh, a, a particular somebody sent me a particular picture that they took from I think Instagram and it was a picture of a uh, Hussein Bolt and his, I don't, his wife or girlfriend I don't know 
and um, they have some twin boys, I think, twin boys. And the report was that uh, congratulations, Nassin, something like that, congratulations to Hussein on the birth of his twin sons. And this was announced by CNN. Now, somebody commented on it, and the person was saying, how dare CNN to decide that these two children are sons? In other words, what the person was saying is that they should wait until the child grow up, and then they decide what identity, what sex they should be. It shows you the twistedness of this world. It shows you how the devil operates and how messed up the devil is and how messed up he has messed up people's mind to, to, that they can't even identify that the boys are boys. But that's how the devil operates. He wants to call black white and white black. That is why when you're in the house of God and you try to live for God, people, a lot of people find you weird. You're not one of the cool ones who want to do every and everything. It's weird. It doesn't fit in. That's the devil. But I pray God that we'll come to a point where we begin to understand that that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to attack everything that God has instituted. But guess what? We can fight back against it. And it starts with us identifying who Jesus is first. We're talking about our heritage and our identity. Our heritage first starts in the fact that we must first identify who Jesus is. That is why Jesus asked the disciples, whom do you say I am? He was not concerned about people saying that he was Apollos or, or, or he, saying that he was a prophet or Jeremiah or Elias or whatever. He wanted to know what they thought of him. And therefore, praise God, we realize that the first attack on the church was an attack on who Jesus is. I know this is not Bible school, but I'm going to show you four different things that has come over the years that has attacked who Jesus is. In other words, people don't want you to know who this Jesus is. Because the moment you get into a, a revelation, a true revelation of Jesus, a true revelation of Jesus, it changed your life forever. Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In other words, when he saw Jesus, it changed his life. John, even though he walked with God for three and a half years, when the Bible said he was in the spirit in, in chapter one, when he saw a view of the glorified Christ, the Bible said he fell at his feet as dead. In other words, when you get a true picture of who Jesus is, it kills you. It kills this flesh. It kills you to the point where you want to be in his presence. I want to be like you. So the devil's aim from the first century was to attack who Jesus is. So there's a thing called adoptionism. And this came about in the second century, the second or the third century. It's an attack on who Jesus is. What they were saying is that, first of all, that Jesus, when he was born, he was not the Messiah. But over the years at his baptism, God adopted him to become deity. And at his ascension, it was removed. That's a lie. Jesus was 100% God when he was born and he was 100% man. As a matter of fact, he had to be God and man at all times. He had to be a perfect man so that he could redeem you and he could die. But you had to be God, because only God alone could have brought the salvation that was required for us to be saved. But the devil wants us to attack that, so we don't understand who Jesus is. There's a teaching that was going on at some point in time, and I've heard it by one famous preacher on TV. Amen, am I right? Who said that, look here, at Jesus' uh, crucifixion, he said that, look here, that was the only point in time where the spirit of Christ, or Christ, his divinity, was separated from his humanity. So when he said that, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? It was based on the fact that at that point in time, Jesus was not God. The divinity was separated from his humanity. That's a lie. There was never a point in scripture where Jesus was not God and he was not man. 
if there was a point in time where he was not God, then he could not have saved you. That's a lie. That's an attack on who Jesus is. Can I tell you something, brethren? When Jesus made that quote, he was quoting David in the psalm. And if you can remember, David was going through a hard time in his life. And he felt as if God had forsaken him. And he quoted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not that God has removed himself from him. But it seemed as if when he was going through his darkest hour, that God was not there with him. In a similar way, when God was pouring out the judgment of the world upon this man, it seemed as if God had, had removed himself from him. But that's God. Jesus was always God and he was always man. There's always going to be an attack on who Jesus is. There's another thing called docetism. And they're saying that Jesus, when he was on earth, he was not man. They're saying that what we saw was a phantom of a man. In other words, he, was, he, he appeared like a man. You know that like the theophan is in the Old Testament? He appeared like a man, but he was not really a man. That's a lie. He had to be man. He was 100% man. As a matter of fact, one of the requirements of the high priest in the Old Testament... That's why Moses was not a high priest. The requirement is that the high priest had to come from among the people. That is why Moses, even though he was chosen to lead the people, could not be the high priest. The high priest had to be Aaron because Aaron was selected from among the people. He understood what the people were going through. He understood the troubles of the people. In order for God to redeem us, he had to become a man. So he is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He knows your struggles. He knows how it feels to be betrayed. He knows how it feels to be heartbroken. He knows how it feels to be hurt. And therefore, he is touched. He can, he, can, he, can, he can look at you and say, Brethren, I have been there. In every way where you are tempted, he has been tempted. In every trouble that you have gone through, he has gone through it. How does you think it feels to be with somebody for three and a half years? And at the end of the day, the man went away and sold you out. And then he came back and kissed you. Sell you out. How do you think it feel when you realize that Peter, amen, said, look, I never knew this man. And all the disciples ran away and left him alone. The man knew how it felt. He was not a phantom man. He was 100% man. And he had to be 100% man so that he could redeem you. There's also uh, what we call Mar Marcionism. And this guy was teaching you that, look here, the Jesus of the New Testament is not the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He was saying that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is a total different God. Amen. He was, a, he was this guy who was teaching that, look here, man, he rejected the entire Hebrew Old Testament and the God of Israel. He was saying the God of Israel was too terrible. But Jesus of the New Testament is seen to be merciful and kind. But you forget that when we get an understanding of who Jesus is, we'll realize that even though Jesus was the Lamb a uh, lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He is also the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. We must understand also that even though God can be a merciful God, our God is also a consuming fire. And therefore, while we, we, we can get mercy from God, we must be careful because he's also a God of judgment. Amen. And every knee is going to bow before him. This doctrine attacks a part of God, which says that attacks the part of him that says he's a God of judgment. And he is... And that's, what, and, and that's why people live in a particular way because they think they can do any and anything. But when you get an understanding of who Jesus is, it makes you realize that even though he's a merciful God, he's also a God who there comes a point in time when he says he can be cut off and that without remedy. There's also an attack on, on God. We see in Trinitarianism, which came in the middle of the 4th century. It started from about the 2nd century, but it was fully developed by the 4th century. Teaching that God is a triune God. And reveal himself as three, a co-equal, co-eternal. Uh, we know the whole story of Trinity. It, di it divides God. But Jesus was not a, a, a second person in no Trinity. The Bible says, in him dwelt all the fullness of the God and bodily. When we say Jesus, we are seeing the same God, amen, that called this world into being. The Bible said, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. In other words, Jesus is God Almighty. He is the God of the Old Testament that enrobed himself in flesh. That he can reveal himself to you to tell you that, look here, you are more than who you say you are.
I want us to understand that the Bible says in Hebrews that without faith it is impossible to please him. I'm going to tell you why. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. In other words, the first premise of the child of God is first to come to an understanding of who God is. An understanding of who this Jesus is. He must believe that he is and that is a reward of them that diligently seek him. I like how, he, like how the scripture put it. If you're going to come to God, you must first have a revelation of who he is. God wants us not to just think that he's any other person. A lot of us treat him like, 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 like we don't realize that this is the God of God and the King of Kings. And because judgment is not speedily executed, we think we can just walk on him. But guess what? In you understanding your Pentecostal heritage, you need to understand that who this God is. He's the God of God. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the conquering land of the tribe of Judah. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. Amen. Every angel, can you imagine, as powerful as angels are, amen, they have to, they, they, the Bible said the seraphims have to put their wings before their faces when they come into his presence because of his magnificence. One angel was able to kill thousands of men. But guess what? These same angels have to bow themselves with twain they cover their face in his presence. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, uh, um, the Bible in, 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 in Timothy said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. In other words, angels who were with God from the inception have never seen him. The first time they actually got a glimpse of God was in the form of Jesus. That's why the writer Timothy says, seen of angels. They have never seen the glorified God. God is too magnificent, too mighty. He fills the universe to the point where angels can't even behold him. And the first time they even got a glimpse of him was when they behold him in the face of Jesus Christ. You can believe that? And that's the God that we serve. We need to get a revelation, Holy Ghost, of this God. So, praise God. Now, in, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the Gospel of Luke records where the plan of Christ initiated. So, we're going back to our heritage to look at some of the things that, that, that we need to hold dear to our hearts. Luke 24, from verse 46 to 47, 49 says, And he spake unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was, with, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. In other words, everything that was written in the Old Testament was talking about him. The law, the prophets, and the writings, and the law, the prophets, and the Psalms were practically talking about Jesus Christ. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto him, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And behold, I sent the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until he be endued with power from on high. It's so from Luke's gospel, we can deduce the following. And we're talking about our heritage. We can deduce some of the following. One, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what people are saying today. We're talking about our heritage. We're trying to hold back on to, or we're trying to declare to this generation, amen, what our heritage is, what, our, what, what, what the scriptures tell us our heritage is. And when we look in the writings of Luke, we realize that repentance and remission of sins, which is the same as the baptism, should be preached in his name. We also realize that the Holy Ghost, which is the power that we get from on high, is the promise of the Father. And we realize that the church started on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. You see, nowadays there are a lot of things going on. A lot of people say, boy, they are part of the church, and their church started 1920-something. Or the church, or some people declare that the church started from Sinai, from the Old Testament. Or the church started while Jesus was around. Mm -mm. The church started on the day of Pentecost. 
The church started with them getting the Holy Ghost. Uh, and the church started with baptism and repenting of be preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just make a point here also. There's a teaching going on that, look here, you have to get baptized using the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you have to get baptized using Jesus Christ. In other words, you can't say Jesus. Now, let me define, let me just clear that up for persons who are concerned about that. From the inception, the Bible says in Matthew 1, 21, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. It's the name that God, the angel declared, is the name Jesus. When you say Lord Jesus, Lord is a title that was used for Jesus. Speaks to the fact that he is, you know, like you can say, sir or doctor. Lord was a title. Also, Christ is also a title. Christ is, is, is Greek rendering, I think, of Messiah, which actually means the anointed one. So when we say Lord Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ, or Lord Jesus, the truth is Lord was a title. Christ was a title. But the name is Jesus. If I baptize you and I say I now baptize you in the name of Jesus, you are baptized. Because the name of Jesus is where the power lies. Don't let people come and tell you stupidness that look here, you have to do it a particular way. Amen. The name of Jesus is where the power lies. At the name of Jesus, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. That's the name that where the power lies. I just wanted to clear that up. Because as I said before, as we come closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, you're going to realize there's going to be a lot of attack on our heritage, a lot of attack on what the church really teaches. I'm going to stop here for tonight. Praise God. And what I'm going to be doing is probably continuing on the topic. But the truth be told is that as children of God, I want us to hold fast some very important point. Or better yet, I'll just go on for about 10 more minutes and then we will stop after that, right? So, on the day of Pentecost, let me just continue for 10 more minutes. The fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy took place on the day of Pentecost. When the birth of the church officially began as according to Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. And the first number of saints in the church was about 120. And it increased to about 3,000 souls. So we realized that there were some things that were happening in the church from the first century. Now, what did Peter preach in the first century? He said, then Peter said unto them. So we know what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost came. Men were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, and, and there was a mocking. And Peter began to preach the gospel message. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's an attack also on our heritage. Because here it is that people are saying that the word for there means uh, because of. Now, brethren, let me explain what, they, what some theologians are trying to put forward here. They're saying that then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of the remission of your sins. In other words, do these things because your sins were already remitted. In other words, your sins were already forgiven. And because of that, you can now repent and get baptized. What they're teaching then is that repentance and baptism, especially in the name of Jesus Christ, is not important. They more put forth the last phrase which says baptism is not important. You repent and get baptized because of the remission of your sins. In other words, you're saying then the only reason why you're baptized is because your sins were already remitted. That's a lie. The word for there... And you might hear this come forth, and, and, and I'm happy we're in Bible study tonight so we can learn this. The word for there comes from a Greek word, ice. And many Greek scholars would tell you that it means unto or in order of. 
When you hear people say, because of, that's a wrong interpretation. So you repent and get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ unto the remission of your sins. In other words, when you do these things, when you have repented and you are baptized, that is where the remission of sin comes into effect. Now, you see, if the teaching because of was the true saying of what this verse is saying there in Acts chapter 2, then what would have happened is that it would have contradicted other teachings that Peter actually taught. We're talking about our heritage. And don't worry, we're still talking about what we believe as apostolics, our Christian heritage. What did Peter teach? Let's just look at another verse that Peter spoke about baptism. In 1 Peter chapter 3, from verse 20 to 21. He said, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure. So here it is that he is comparing the eight souls that were saved by water and how they were saved. He was comparing this Noah's experience, the fact that they went into the ark, and he's saying that because they went into the ark, they got saved. And he's now comparing that with baptism. He said, the like figure, we are to even baptism also now not saved us. In other words, what Peter was teaching in that particular verse is that he identified the flood of Noah as a type of water baptism. And from that flood of Noah, we can learn a few things. One, that baptism is salvic. In other words, it has to do with salvation. And secondly, we learn that baptism will be the step taken by the person who has a clear conscience toward God. In other words, to teach that baptism is not important is not scriptures, not scriptural, because it contradicted what Peter is now saying in 1 Peter. Peter is liking on baptism to Noah's flood. If the people did not go in that boat, the eight of them, they would not have been saved. And he's saying the same way that they, they went into the boat and were saved from the flood. The like figure now, baptism now save us. In other words, just like they were saved from the flood by going into the flood, by going into the, 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 the boat, in a similar way, we are saved from the wrath of God and, 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 and from sin and judgment through water baptism. It is salvic. It saves you. It provides salvation. Another attack that we find on the church is an attack on the name of Jesus Christ. It shows that I tell you, brethren, there seems to be an attack on our apostolic heritage. But as children of God, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We need to ensure that we are in the book. Because guess what happened? As we're coming closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, we're going to realize that there's, the devil is trying to poke holes into the teachings that you have. But I can tell you something. You are on the solid rock. You are on the truth of God. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And let me show you something. Even in the Catholic encyclopedia, people will tell a boy, um, you don't need to get baptized in Jesus' name. That's a lie. If you're here tonight and you're not baptized in Jesus' name, let me tell you something. That's the only way to be saved. Acts 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So guess what? The Catholic Encyclopedia, second edition, page 263. And I took the quote. It said the baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by the Catholic Church in the second century. That's in the encyclopedia. Go look it up. So guess what? If it was changed in the second century, and the church started in the first century, I prefer to follow what the first century church teach. Huh? But there's an attack, and a lot of people are deceived. Is that scripture that we just read a while ago in Peter, where the Bible said, few and eight souls, is a, is a, is a verse that always moved me. And it, 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 it tells me that I need to be sure that I walk this walk very carefully. Because look at the, men, the amount of people that exist. And the amount of people that lived in the world. And only eight people were saved. 
brethren, we have to ensure that we get it right. So we see that the name of Jesus is the only saving name. Philippians 2, 9 to uh, 11 says, Whereby God had highly exalted him and had given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's an attack on salvation. There's an attack on baptism. There's an attack on the name. But there was also an attack on the very lifestyle that we live. So we see in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. It says, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. That's talking about Paul. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. And taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So in Antioch, what had happened is that they used the term Christians to mock the followers of Jesus Christ. A lot of us don't even realize that when they were first called Christians, it was not a term like a nice term. They were mocking them. Actually, Antioch was famous according to history for its readiness to jeer and call names. It was known by its witty epigrams. In other words, these were people that were, 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 were jeering the people. But guess what? The people of Antioch appreciated the title so much that it stuck. I prefer you call me a Christian. I prefer you call me a holy roller. I prefer you call me old fashioned. Make it stuck. Because I'm identified with the man Christ Jesus. Then you to say, boy, I can't know if this person is a Christian or not. I prefer people say, look, I'm an old fashioned Christian. Then people say, I'm not sure if she's a Christian. I'm not sure if he's a Christian. So there is an attack on our lifestyle, but we must understand our heritage. We were first called Christians at Antioch. It was a mock, mockery, but it stuck. And to this very day, when we say we are Christians, it don't mean nothing bad to us, because it means that we are followers of Christ. So two notable characteristics of the early church are one, when you talk about our lifestyle, you talk about their unity our heritage, our unity, and all that believe were together and had all things come on. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. Can we get back there? And guess what? The second notable characteristic of the church is that they demonstrated the power of God. Can I tell somebody something? We need to get back to the point where we realize who we are. We, are, we, 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 we have lost some things. By this shall all men know that we are disciples if we have love one for another. Amen. We need to get back to a place where people can say, boy, that's the church. Where we can say, we can, I have forgiven you and we truly mean it. So the doctrinal heritage of the church, our heritage from the first century, is that we believe a couple of things. One, and I want us to, if you have time, to spend the time to learn these things as children of God. One, we believe in the oneness of God. Child of God, it doesn't change. We believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. We believe that Jesus, that, that, that the God of the Old Testament, realized that, we, that, that none of us, we, we needed salvation. There was a gap that needed to be, to, to, to be brought between us and him. And he manifested himself into flesh. And he became that, that bridge over troubled water that me and you can meet up with a God, with God. We believe in the oneness of, uh, oneness of God. There is only one God. One God. We don't believe in triune God. We believe in one God. We believe in the gospel. And the gospel message is simply this. That when we were dead in trespasses and sin. Amen. Jesus came and he died on the cross. He died that wicked death for us. The most excruciating death. And he was buried. He was placed in a tomb. And he was resurrected. That's the gospel message that we believe. We believe in repentance for the remission of sins. Amen. We don't believe that you can just feel sorry. Repentance has steps and phases. And if we need to go back sometime, we have to go back to foundational things. So we can build ourselves. We believe in repentance for the remission of sins. Paul said, I die daily. Repent. We believe in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. These things still hold forth for us. That's our heritage child of God. 
We believe in spiritual growth and maturity. Amen. The, the, the apostle said, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You can't be in church 20 years and still wearing pampas. You can't be in church for so much years. I understand that you make some mistakes 10 years ago or 5 years ago or 15 years ago, but you cannot be making the same mistakes every day. No, brethren, let it be a new mistake if there's going to be one. We believe in reading and studying the Bible. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We have to read it and we have to study it. We study, as the Bible said in Timothy, to show ourselves approved unto God. Don't be satisfied with just being fed on a Sunday morning in service. Find something to read. Find persons who can help you. We believe in prayer and fasting. There are some things that can only, some devils can only get out of the house of God through fasting and prayer. We believe in the translation of the saints. In other words, we believe that there is coming a day. And that is what, this is one of the fears that I have to, because a lot of us live our lives like we don't realize that Christ can come back any day. The rapture can take place right now. And because we don't live with that level of expectancy, that level of urgency that it can happen now, we live our lives any and any way. We believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus went away and he's coming again. And everybody is going to see him. My God. And because we believe that the Bible said in Jude chapter 1 verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. You see them things that I'm talking to you about, brethren? Fight for it. Fight for it. Now is not the time to give it up. We are Christians in how we live. We are Christians in how we walk. We are Christians in how we talk. All of those things that we spoke about earlier, our doctrine still has power that it did in the first century. So the Bible says we have a, guess what, we have a rich heritage. And it's important that we do what? We fight for it. Judge in, according to Jude chapter 1 verse 3. Earnestly contend for the faith. It's important also that we guard it. Guard it with your life. The scripture talk about the gentleman who found the pearl in the field and he sold everything he had. Hallelujah. That he might obtain that pearl. This is what you have in Christ. Hallelujah. It's so powerful. It's so, it's, it is going to keep you in this life. Amen. A lot of us don't realize the, 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 the pearl that we have. And therefore we treat it like it's a stone, like a normal stone. But what we have is the most valuable thing. Our heritage. Our Christian heritage. What we have guarded. And it doesn't matter what the devil come with. Do not sell it. First Kings chapter 21, the man was, the, when, 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 when uh, Jezebel wanted him to sell him, him land. He didn't say, he said, not where sell it. This was a family thing and he was hold on to it. This is what the apostles fought for and they lived their life for. I mean, not selling out. For one gratitude of what? For one night of fun? Not selling it out and holding on to it. And guess what? We're not going to be intimidated by the enemy either. Because some of us, we want to start rebuilding our walls. We realize that there are holes in the wall. We realize that the, the wall has been broken down. And like Nehemiah, we are broken in our hearts and we want to rebuild the wall. But guess what? The enemy is going to come to you and say, look here, what are you doing? He doesn't say a friend of mine going to laugh after you. He doesn't say if a little fox run on the wall, it's going to turn over. Don't let the devil intimidate you. Make up your mind to work. The Bible said the people had a mind to work. And with one hand they fight. And with one hand they build. One hand you go and call the sword. And another hand you go and build back your Christian life where it's supposed to be. Let your dressing reflect Christ. Let your speech reflect Christ, Hakbosa. Let your talk reflect Christ. We have a rich heritage who was keeping our mind that Jesus actually died for it. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says he, he purchased it with his own blood. He never sent somebody else. He never sent Gabriel or Michael. 
or any of the archangels, he came and he purchased it with his own blood. They put thorns on his head and blood run. They put nails in his hands and blood run. They whip his back. They give him vinegar to drink. They pierce his side to the point where it pierces his heart and blood and water flow. Rich heritage we have. And not all that Jesus died for, the apostles, when we say the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophet, understand the cost that they did to ensure that you and I have it. According to history, when we look at the martyrs of the old, we realize the cost that they did. Don't, what they, don't, don't, don't treat it like petty. Don't treat it like it's something low. So we look at the Christian martyrs. Stephen was stoned to death. According to history. Stone because he was preaching this message. And he preached this message. And because he continued to preach this message, it reached you. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded. They cut off his head. But he never stopped. It cost these men their lives. Philip was beaten and then crucified. Matthew was slain in Ethiopia. Mark, also known as John Mark, was dragged through the streets and his body burnt in Alexandria. My God. James, the Lord's brother, was, was, was stoned and beheaded. But uh, he was beaten and his head was bashed in with a club, actually. That's what history has to say. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Andrew was crucified. Luke was hanged on an olive tree. And Peter was crucified upside down. Listen, brethren, we have a heritage. And when we understand the cost of getting it, our Christian heritage, it lets us walk as we should. Brethren, too much has gone at stake. Too much has gone for us to just live, amen, a life in this time. You see, as we are coming closer to the coming of the Lord, the devil wants to, to switch things on us. He wants the church to operate like not the church. But we are in the church triumphant. When we look at the sweat and the blood of the apostles, when we look at what Jesus did on the cross, when we look at everything, the, the, the same power that they had in the first century, it's still alive today. And every child of God needs to understand that, look here, we have a heritage that we need to preserve. Tonight I've passed down a few things to you about what happened from the first year. I, I told you that it's God's, it's God's thing for us to pass it on from generation to generation. Hallelujah. I have showed you two scriptures that look here. You need to understand who you are. You're not what the world defines you as. Even if, praise God, even if they catch you in the very act, like the woman in Acts chapter 8. When they brought him before Jesus, the Bible said that, that, that Jesus said, He that is without sin among let him cast the first stone. And the Bible said they walk out one from, from the greatest to the least. Hallelujah. And the woman practically felt a level of condemnation. Jesus said to him, So where are those that accuse us that no man condemn thee? I said, nay, Lord. I said, neither do I condemn thee. Jesus wants to bring you to a place where you can say, go your way and sin no more. I pray, God, that tonight we will realize that we are part of a powerful church. A church that holds on to the name. A church that knows who Jesus is. A church that preaches Jesus and him crucified. And I want us to understand that the apostles, amen, because of its importance, they ensure that this message reached us where we are, wherever you are in the world, wherever you're watching from. Don't trample it. The Bible says we should not cast our pearls before swines. Don't consider yourself to be a swine. Hallelujah. But understand the value of what God has called you into. Understand the value of what you have. And ask God to help us to live a life that is pleasing to him. 
it doesn't matter, as we said earlier, what had happened last week or last year. What is important is that you come to the realization that Nehemiah, who, when he realized that the wall was broken down, he said, look here, man, I must go back and build back the wall. Is there anybody who wants to build back the walls of their lives, of their Christian lives, build back the walls of their Christian heritage? Amen. All the things that, were, that, that, that they have read in scriptures, it can be a part of your life. Tonight we're going to close in prayer. And I pray God that at the end of the day, amen, that somebody would have been blessed today. Walk in your heritage. Walk in your heritage. You are who God say you are. Let me say it again. You are not a chicken. You are an eagle. Bow your heads as we pray. Great God, we exalt you tonight. We magnify your great name for you are worthy to be praised. We thank you, God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And your words declare greater love at no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. But while we were not even your friend, you saw it fit to die for us. We ask you, God, we thank you, Lord, that we are a part of a great heritage. We are a part of the ecclesia, the church triumphant. The church that is alive and well. The church that is going to make it into rapture. The church, Jesus, hallelujah, which you said before us, there's an open door. And I pray right now, God, that every child of God that will come to an acknowledgement of who we are. will align our minds, amen, with the word of God. That we are royal priesthood. That we are a holy nation. That we are a peculiar people. That we are a child of God. That we are citizens of heaven. Hallelujah. I pray right now, God, that you'll touch our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk in unity again. Help us, Lord Jesus, even in these last days, to come to a point, Jesus, where we begin to walk as Christians, that we begin to talk as Christians, that our lives will reflect you, that when people will see like they did in the church of Antioch, they will say, there goes some child of God. I pray right now, God, that you'll touch each and every one of us, even in this season Oh God, where the enemy, hallelujah, the Bible says in, the, in Timothy, oh God, that the spirit speaks expressed that, that in the last days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Oh God, it were declared that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent and fierce. And you, and you go on and on. But help us to realize, Jesus, that we are children of the light. And this darkness should not overtake us as children of darkness. Help us, Lord, just to be ready waiting. To live a life of expectancy. Hallelujah. To live a life knowing that the rapture can take place any time now. I pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, that you'll cover us under your blood. That this word that we have spoken tonight will rest mightily in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Do a great work in our lives and bring us from strength to strength. I pray for every young person in the sanctuary. We are living in a time, God, where we are tested and we are tried. We are living in a time, Jesus, where, hallelujah, only the persons who have had a made up mind, persons who are willing to run the race to the end, persons who are willing, Lord Jesus, to say, look here, not my will but yours be done, are going to make it. Help us, Lord, to surrender our wills totally to you. Help us, Lord, to come to a place, hallelujah, where we get to know you. Whom to know is life eternal. For any man who comes to Christ must first believe that he is. And that is our word to them that diligently seek him. Continue to bless us, God. Help us, Lord, this word will rest in our heart mightily. As we look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. The God of heaven and earth. Jesus is your name. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. And for what you're about to do in our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God richly bless you. Praise God. I pray God tonight that the word of God will find a place in our hearts. The Bible says in St. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. By way of announcement, I just want to remind us that on Sunday, amen, uh, we'll have group one. And group two out for services. Amen. So persons who are born between January, February, and March is group one. I think their service will be at nine o'clock in the morning. And then persons who from April, May, June 
uh, is a part of group two. Their service will be at 11 o'clock. Let us pray about the services coming up. Praise God. And let us come with an expectancy. Uh, I want preacher put it this way. Expectancy is a breeding ground for miracles. We are going back to our heritage. We are holding on to what God has said. And we are coming Sunday expecting God to do a mighty work in the house of God. We want souls to be saved. We want while somebody is preaching the word, somebody gets the Holy Ghost. Somebody requests baptism. We want to see miracles and signs again. Because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above that which you are able to ask or think. Let us prayerfully pray for these services. I pray God I will be blessed tonight. God bless you and enjoy the rest of your nights as we look to God of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.